Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. I have a soft spot for the underdog. When it comes to the British heavy bombers of the Second World War, everyone remembers the Lancaster. Very few remember the Halifax. After the war, the Halifax faded into utter obscurity. I have been a dedicated Warbird fan for over a quarter century, and although I've seen many static Lancasters in museums and on pedestals, and I've even seen the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum's Lancaster named Vera flying on several occasions, I have never actually laid eyes on a Halifax. I'm left with this question. Why did the Halifax get pushed aside from public memory so quickly? Were they produced in fewer numbers than the Lank? Or were they really so inferior? What's going on here? So let's shed some light on this forgotten warrior. Design and Development The Handley Page Company had a long track record building big bombers. The company had been formed in 1909 by Sir Frederick Henley Page. Prior to researching this episode, I had always figured that the Handley Page Company had been formed between two people, one named Handley and the other one named Page. You know, like Rolls Royce. But no, it was one man. In 1936, the British Air Ministry put out specification P-1336 for a capable medium bomber for worldwide use. Handley Page had plenty of experience with big bombers, having built the Handley Page Type O during the First World War. This giant was a twin-engine biplane with a pilot and two gunners, and it could carry 2,000 pounds of bombs. The Type O was used in a variety of roles, being used to attack ports, railway targets, airfields, submarines, and shipping. Handley Page built 600 of the model. At the very end of the war, HP built the V-1500, which was a bigger version of the Type O. It had four engines, with a pusher and a puller engine in two nacelles. It could carry 7,000 pounds of bombs and fly 1,300 miles. This monster was meant as a night heavy bomber, but the war ended before it could be used to bomb Germany from airfields in the UK. They built about 35 of the type, and they were known as the Super Handley in the RAF. After the end of World War I, some Type O's were converted for civilian use as passenger and cargo transport and for airmail. These aircraft were so ubiquitous that to say Handley Page, was a shorthand to say big airplane. So with specification P-1336, Handley Page seemed to have a significant head start. The RAF was looking for a twin-engine bomber at the time and was trusting in the development of the high-powered Rolls-Royce Vulture engine. The promise of this engine was significant. Its design was an X-24 configuration which basically took two Rolls-Royce Peregrine-derived V-12 blocks and arranged them in an X shape, all turning a common crankshaft. This super engine was supposed to produce 1,750 horsepower, which would mean that two engines would be sufficient to power the new heavy bomber. Handley Page began drawing up blueprints. February 1937 was probably the first time that the so far unnamed bomber was to be outshone by its sister from Avro. When the company's submission, which would later be called the Avro Manchester, was selected as the primary candidate for production, and Handley Page's airplane was chosen as the second string. In April, orders were placed for two prototypes of each type. Just three months later, in July, Handley Page's designers must have been very frustrated when they were told by the Air Ministry to go back to the drawing board to redesign the airplane to use four engines instead of the two Rolls-Royce Vultures. It turns out the Vulture was having many problems with lubrication, dissipating heat, and it tended to have too many connecting rod failures. The Vulture's ambitious power output was also never realized, and it ended up being derated down to about 1,500 horsepower instead. 
Although the primary aircraft on the contract, the Avril Manchester, would continue with the Vulture, the Ministry wanted the second-string Handley Page plane to experiment with using four of the Rolls-Royce's other engine, the Merlin. Although the designers were not happy, they went back to their drawing boards, and by the end of the year they had mock-ups, and by March 1938 they were building two prototypes. The Ministry was so pleased with Handley Page's work that they ordered 100 of the new airplane right off the drawing board. Prototypes The first prototype, serial number L7244, was a mid-wing monoplane with twin tail fins and rudders. It was of an all-metal construction with a smooth, stressed skin, although the flight control services were fabric-covered. The fuselage contained a 22-foot bomb bay, which would hold most of the aircraft's payload, and the cockpit was flush with the upper fuselage. It was powered by Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, two spaced evenly on each wing. In the prototype, the Rolls-Royce Merlins were turning a Rotol-built compressed wood constant speed propeller, giving a maximum speed of 265 miles per hour at 17,500 feet. The pilot sat at the left side in the cockpit, and there was a folding seat on the right side for the co-pilot position, which was occupied by the flight engineer for critical periods such as takeoff. In the nose was the bomb aimer's compartment and navigation position, with one crew member doing both jobs. Behind the cockpit was the wireless operator's compartment and the flight engineer's station. Just aft of this compartment were two installed bunks, originally intended for crew members to rest, but in practice were used more for treating injured crew. The Mark I had two 303 Vickers K machine guns in waist positions, which brings to mind the waist gunners of the B-17. The maximum bomb load was 14,500 pounds, which was carried in a somewhat unorthodox way, with most of the bombs being carried in a main bomb bay, within the fuselage, and some being carried in three mini-bomb compartments in the inboard sections of each wing. Because of this configuration, the maximum size of the individual bombs which could be carried was limited to 2,000 pounds. In August 1940, the second prototype, L7245, was flown with complete armament and operational equipment, and the type was accepted into the RAF. At the time, the practice was to name heavy bombers after major towns, and so the aircraft was formally named the Halifax. Most fittingly in a ceremony by none other than Lord and Lady Halifax. Production The UK put a huge effort into building as many Halifaxes as possible for its strategic bombing offensive against Germany. And this meant that many more parties than Handley Page would be involved. A special Halifax group was put together to manage the over 600 subcontractors who built components for the Halifax or assembled them. In total, 6,178 Halifaxes were built by five different main manufacturers, including Handley Page, Ferry Aircraft, London Aircraft, Production Group, Roots Securities with English Electric actually building the most at 2,145 aircraft. At its peak production, a new Halifax was being built every hour. Improvements were made to the Halifax throughout its operational life, and these are reflected in the various marks of the Halifax. Although there are subversions of each mark, for simplicity's sake I've bunched them together into the main marks. The Mark II saw the removal of the nose turret. It was replaced by a molded Perspex nose and the addition of a four-gun dorsal turret with the waist gun being removed. The tail fin shape was also tweaked in order to try to fix some rudder imbalances and the Merlin 22 engines were installed. The most numerous mark was the Mark III, which used the powerful 1650 horsepower Bristol Hercules 16 radial engine. 
It also had rounded wingtips. There was a transport version with a cargo area instead of a bomb bay, and space inside for 11 passengers, and a paratroop version with space for 16 paratroopers and their kit. A pure passenger transport version was built, which was known as the Handley Page Halton. Operational History In late 1940, the first Halifaxes began service with No. 35 Squadron RAF, and it first dropped bombs on the enemy on the night of 10 to 11 March 1941, when they bombed the dockyards of Le Havre in France. By the end of 1941, daylight bombing was suspended because of unsustainable losses due to intensifying fighter opposition. Bomber Command would switch its efforts to night attack. Halifaxes played a major role in the bombing offensive against Germany. Especially with the arrivals of the Mark III's with their more powerful engines, which increased their performance, Halifaxes seemed to perform service everywhere, area bombing at night, pathfinding for the main bomber force, switching to daylight operations after D-Day for performing tactical type attacks upon enemy troops and gun emplacements, and knocking out launching sites for V-1 flying bombs. Halifaxes were used for parachute attacks, towing gliders, transporting fuel, and near the end of the war, attacking the Reich's oil supply. It was even used as an electronic warfare aircraft using airborne radio countermeasures to harass and confound the Luftwaffe. Finally, Halifaxes were also used for special operations, parachuting agents and weapons into occupied Europe for the Special Operations Executive, or SOE. Many Halifaxes were used by Coastal Command for reconnaissance, anti-submarine duties, meteorological, and to lay mines outside enemy-held ports. Halifaxes fought right up until the end of the conflict and remained in service with Coastal Command and RAF Transport Command, Royal Egyptian Air Force, and the Armée de l'Air until early 1952. Although the majority of them were declared surplus in 1947. The last country to use the Halifax in a military role was Pakistan, its air force continuing to operate them until 1961. So, why was the Halifax so forgotten? It is clear that Bomber Harris seemed to have a grudge against Handley Page from the very beginning, and against the Halifax in particular. Certainly, much of his aggravations with the type were justified. The rudder problem was one that, even with modification, never really went away. If a Halifax pilot threw his machine to sudden and dramatic maneuvers in order to try to escape from flak and night fighters, they were likely to unbalance, lock on, and eventually produce a spiral dive from which it was difficult to recover. Also, during much of its operational life, it was slightly slower and had a lower ceiling than the Lancaster, which meant that it was more vulnerable to attack. Its exhaust flames were brighter and allowed the Halifax to be spotted from further away. Harris complained that he had to use his more valuable lanks as a safety blanket to protect the more vulnerable Halifaxes. The Halifaxes also just weren't able to carry the same massive bomb load as the Lancaster. Not only was its smaller and subdivided bomb bay incapable of carrying the big 4,000 pound cookie bombs, or any of the more exotic bigger weapons of the RAF, but also, on average, over its operational life, it would only deliver 100 tons of bombs onto German targets, while a Lancaster would deliver 150. It also took more labor to build one. It took more man-hours to build a Halifax than it took to build a Lancaster. In the cold light of Bomber Command's accounting, the Halifax was a poorer investment. So why did Britain keep building Halifaxes and supplying them to the squadrons if they were inferior? The main problem was that of conversion. If the British aircraft industry was to start converting its production over to Lancasters, then there would be an overall drop in bomber production during that time while the factories rejigged. For British leadership all the way up to Churchill, this was unacceptable. 
Sure, don't commit any new production to the Halifax, but also don't stop the factories building them from doing so. It was better to keep producing the inferior aircraft in numbers than to have an overall drop in those numbers. Also, there was some worry that there wouldn't be enough Merlin engines to fit to additional Lancaster airframes. It was convenient that the Halifax used an alternate engine in the Bristol Hercules. The Merlin was in great demand for use in fighter command as well as in the Mosquito. Lastly, not everything was worse with the Halifax. Firstly, crew survivability was better than in the Lancaster. If things went very bad, the hatches in the Halifax were far easier to use in escape than with the Lank. In the end, the British were wedded to their existing bomber types during the war, and Bomber Command was able to work with the Halifax's advantages and disadvantages, diverting them for heavy bomber tasks connected with Operation Overlord and freeing up the Lanks to continue their deep penetration raids on Germany. Survivors it's really rather remarkable that this type of aircraft, which was produced in such great numbers, would only be represented today by only three survivors, two in the UK and one in Canada. Only two of these are actually restored, and none are airworthy. NA-337 has been restored and can be visited at the National Air Force Museum of Canada in Trenton, Ontario. On the night of the 23rd April 1945, this Halifax was hit by flak during a supply drop mission to Mikkelsberget, Norway. Both starboard engines caught fire and the aircraft ditched in a lake. All but one of the crew died and the aircraft rested at the bottom of the lake until it was raised in 1995. The aircraft parts were flown to Canada by the RCAF and underwent a complete restoration and after 350,000 man-hours of labor... And a 337 is back to her former glory and on display at the National Air Force Museum of Canada. So a restored Halibag is nice, but wouldn't it be nice to see and hear one fly again? One can only hope. Until the next time.